any startup you're going to work at, it's not going to be all one gender. If you're a woman, it's very unlikely. So you're going to need to work with guys. So you should be going to events that have guys. And it's not that guys don't want to help, but we have to give them opportunities for them to be allies. And we were stunned at, the, at what we saw that, uh, according to one uh, data set we looked at, only 3% of the startups were founded by, by women in, in the tech and engineering sector. Like uh, parents who have uh, academic credentials, for example. People who are able to give uh, you know, the sort of guidance and be role models for what it's like to achieve academically. And credentialing is still a big deal. Uh, and so if, if, if you try to get work uh, in this business, uh, there, there are plenty of very large very big startups that turned into large companies that are all about the credentials and less about what it is that the, the person has actually been able to accomplish in their life. And that's what pisses me off with meritocracy. A lot of conferences offer scholarships. That's great. But it doesn't solve the problem that still occurs if you're a woman or a person of color. You come to a conference and you look out or you look out there and everyone doesn't look like you, you feel alone. So they took the extra step and they said, if you get a scholarship, we'll actually pair you with an experienced Ruby developer to show you around the conference and you know, introduce you to people. And, and so basically they're saying, we will help um, introduce you to this network. What's interesting about this trajectory is that I spent more than 10,000 hours as a kid learning about my computer and getting to know it and really being passionate about it. But I had no idea that I could take that passion and actually translate it into a career because mm -hmm. I didn't see any people up there who look like me. Yeah. So without that, you know, it, somebody said it to me very succinctly. They said, if you, if you don't see it, you don't know that you can be it. So for those of you who are in the startup world, you know that communication is really important. Uh, but we all know that there are people out there called know-it-alls. So they seem to have an opinion about every single subject. Mansplaining is specifically when a guy tells a woman something that she already knows. Because as you've heard from this panel, I think what counts a lot is the distance traveled, not just getting to the finish line. You know, I, I, I developed uh, biases against Hispanic people. Uh, and that's me, you know, with, with you know, a handful of, of positive Hispanic role models in my life. You know, my mom, who's a very hardworking person. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I had my own biases. And so a, I, I think it's really essential to understand that no matter who you are, there's going to be biases. And it's okay as long as you acknowledge those biases and work very, very hard to, to understand and overcome them. And most importantly, not subject other people to the consequences of your unthinking biases. You can look at it very selfishly, which is if the U.S. wants to maintain its current economic standard of living, it's got to figure out how to use all of the talent available to it. Yeah. What if you can't be a judge unless you've been successful at building a really inclusive corporate culture. Mm -hmm. So it's really what we value. It's yeah. what we decide counts. And then we somehow come up with all these subjective criteria and we assign points to them and we add them up and we said, gosh, aren't we objective? No, you're not. So let's, let's start from a new clean sheet of paper about what matters. I, I think, um that's profoundly said and wise and it's got me thinking like maybe we just have to change why we're selecting each of the judges you know clearly people want judges who have big bankrolls to invest in them but there could be other reasons and you've got me thinking and for that I'm very thankful my tea out of the way here hey how you doing I like it we got a dog excellent um, we tried really hard this year to um, focus on diversity. A lot of people talk about diversity in conferences. A lot of people talk about it on their blogs or their email newsletters. I recently wrote some stuff about it, trying to get the conversation going forward. And um, I, I got a little bit flamed, but I, I got made a lot of new friends, actually. Um, and some of them are on the panel. And I wanted to just have a group discussion about moving forward. How do we make our industry more diverse? A lot of folks here are part of different organizations doing that. We gave about, I don't know, 20 different organizations, five or 10 tickets each. No. And somebody just came up to me in the lunchroom and said, Jason, why are there so many women here? And I just thought, that's a really, thank you to the women here. Um, and I said, well, 
we always struggled with how to get women at the event and, and speakers and stuff like that. So we just started tweeting, does anybody know any female founders? And then we got, you know, 20 or 30. Then we asked them, do you know any? And then it spiraled, and that's why there's so many uh, women here. So you, it can be done. Um, but I'll let uh, my good friend Vivek Wadwa take over, and uh, good luck. Good. You know, before I came to Silicon Valley about three and a half years ago, I used to be a mild-mannered professor, believe it or not. It doesn't seem that way, but I, but I was. And uh, then um, uh, I started writing for TechCrunch, and that takes a mild mannedness out of you to start with. And uh, I happened to go to, go to uh, TechCrunch, con con Crunchiest Conference, uh, with my wife. And we were sitting uh, you know, on the front, and Mark Zuckerberg was sitting, like, was sitting uh, you know, about two seats from us. So my wife, in the middle of the program, says, Vivek, do you notice something strange over here? I said, yeah, that's Mark Zuckerberg. Wow. I mean, she says, no, forget about Mark Zuckerberg. Look around. What do you see? And I said, uh, you know, my, my, a lot of different people, mostly young people. She says, look at their, um, uh, their gender, uh, mostly male. She says, look on the stage. How many women have you seen? Uh, just two so far. Heather Hardy, the CEO of TechCrunch, and a circus performer. And uh, that was a, a big shock to me, because before that, if any of you followed my work, I was writing about diversity in Silicon Valley. I called it the ultimate meritocracy. I documented that 52% of the startups in Silicon Valley were founded by people like me, people born abroad. I raved about how anyone, anywhere could come and make it in this fabulous land and how it was a model for how the world should be. Until that TechCrunch event. And that was eye-opening for me. And I had researched entrepreneurship. I went back and analyzed my data. I, I got a number of re other researchers to start looking at with me. And we were stunned at, the, at what we saw that, uh, according to one uh, data set we looked at, only 3% of the startups were founded by, by women in, in the tech and engineering sector. And then I started looking into why this was happening, what was happening. And the more I analyzed it, the more I was shocked at what I saw, that there's actually no difference between successful men and successful women. If you look at every data point, women tend to do better than men, men do. I started writing about it. And uh, all hell broke loose uh, when I, with my first uh, piece, which was titled Silicon Valley, you and your venture capitalists have, have a gender problem. Um, it was bad enough getting nasty emails uh, from some of the people at TechCrunch. But what was worse was the private emails I was getting from my, from my male friends. Venture capitalists, respected people who I look up to, saying, Vivek, uh, if you want to make it in Silicon Valley, don't bring up such issues. Friendly advice. Another one says, hey, Vivek, uh, what's your agenda? Are you trying to get laid? I mean, it, just horrible, horrible uh, messages like that. And I said, something is seriously wrong over here, that this is, uh, when you get attacked so vehemently, something, you know, it tells you that uh, you're hitting nerves. I started researching it more and more and writing more and more about it. And then uh, I had Hispanics and blacks point out to me that, look, how many blacks did you see over there? At the tech conference event, there was one black guy on stage representing a CEO, but he was the to token black on the stage. There were no other blacks there. And I don't even recall seeing a Hispanic at that entire event. My hat's off to Jason for this event. If you look around, it's pretty diverse. It's not uh, perfect, but it's much better than you see anywhere else in Silicon Valley. The fact is that Silicon Valley is not a meritocracy. Yes, if you're um, an aggressive male, if you're an aggressive young male, it doesn't matter where you're from, you can make it big over here. But if you happen to be a black male, or if you happen to be a um, 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 Hispanic woman, you're out of luck. That is the reality of Silicon Valley. We're going to discuss that here. I mean, I was kidding about diversity in our dog, but we have a very diverse audience over here. And I'm going to ask them to tell you their own stories. Uh, Adria, please go first. Hey, everyone. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Adria Richards, and I'm a developer evangelist for SendGrid. So I live here in San Francisco. I go to a lot of hackathons, and so my perspective will be from the ground, talking with developers uh, and talking with women and people of color who have shared their stories and, and thoughts and feelings and discoveries um, on the panel. Danilo, my friend. My name is Danilo Campos. Uh, once upon a time, I built the Hipmunk app, and uh, before that, I did the... Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, I did uh, some indie iOS development. Uh, I was born to a 20-year-old uh, with a GED in Puerto Rico. And I really have no business being in tech, and yet I got here anyway. 
and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how that worked and uh, how we can get more of, uh, folks like me uh, sitting in places like this. And our token white woman. <laughs> I'm just kidding. My friend, Frida. Frida, I respect you very highly, so don't take that badly. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, my name is Frida Kapor Klein. Uh, my first job in tech was at Lotus, the software company that did one, two, three. And my job was to make Lotus the most progressive employer in the U.S. And that was 1984. And we, so we started with a lot of initiatives, a lot of diversity initiatives, uh, lots of things we did through philanthropy, through our own human capital practices. We surveyed all the employees. Every employee had to rate their manager and uh, all the way up to the direct report of the CEO on the day-to-day -day degree to which they lived the values of the company, including diversity. And Manager's scores from their employees were what determined their bonuses. So that was 1984, so I have a lot of experience and history and perspective on what works and what doesn't work. And these days, about a decade ago, I started a nonprofit called the Level Playing Field Institute that does research. We've done a big study on hidden bias in IT work environments. We also run a summer program for low-income, underrepresented students of color, four campuses in California. They come all three summers of high school studying tech, science, math, uh, to make them more competitive with their more privileged counterparts. You know, in the tech world, and especially in academia, we used to fancy, uh, fancy words. No one understands except the people in, the, in their own domains. Adria has a word which uh, fascinates me. It's called man, man what is it, man splashing? I mean, <laughs> what, what, is, what, what in the world is that? Yeah, Vivek, it's called mansplaining. And so for those of you who are in the startup world, you know that communication is really important. Uh, but we all know that there are people out there called know-it-alls. So they seem to have an opinion about every single subject. Mansplaining is specifically when a guy tells a woman something that she already knows, so. Like what? Well, so <laughs> I was on the plane the other day uh, coming back uh, from Long Beach to San Francisco, and uh, I'm sitting next to a wife and a husband, right? And the flight attendant is putting the luggage up top, right? And she's closing it. So the guy's like, push harder on the luggage, right? So I say to the, the wife, I'm like, he's mansplaining. She knows her job. And she's like, I know. So that is, that is mansplaining. Do you think that happens a lot in Silicon Valley? Uh, it does. It actually just happened a little bit ago here. I was telling someone, um, I'm going on at 2 instead of 1.30, and he's like, no, it's going to be later. I'm like, that's strange, because I'm the one going on stage. It is at 2. So it happens a lot. Yeah. Right. Very interesting. You know, when I was uh, uh, raving about Silicon Valley being a meritocracy, I used to get some very angry emails from people every now and then questioning that. And I thought it was just people who, who felt left out, and I couldn't understand why people were so upset when I called Silicon Valley a meritocracy. Do you know why is that? I mean, um, you're not happy about it being called a meritocracy. I think it's a lot more complicated than that. I think that when you've got people talking about Silicon Valley being a meritocracy, you've got a lot of people who are trying to maintain the status quo and insist that everything is just fine as it is and nothing needs to change. And that stance is, frankly, uh, that shit is offensive because what you're saying when you're saying that this industry is a meritocracy is that you are, you're looking at having largely upper uh, and middle class white males as the, the guys who are in authority, the guys who are in control, the guys who are starting things. And you're basically saying, all right, well, if you aren't that, then you don't have merit. Uh, and that's why you're, you're not being represented here. So there's a lot more complexity as to why we have the mix of people that we have here. And it's important to understand that it's not just about how much you want it, how much you're energized to, to participate in this. Not everybody is starting from the same starting place. You've got people who are being born a lot closer to things like uh, parents who have uh, academic credentials, for example. People who are able to give, uh, you know, the sort of guidance and be role models for what it's like to achieve academically. And credentialing is still a big deal. Uh, and so if, if, if you try to get work uh, in this business, uh, there, there are plenty of very large 
very big startups that turned into large companies that are all about the credentials and less about what it is that the, the person has actually been able to accomplish in their life. And that's what pisses me off with meritocracy. You know, Frida, one of the, uh, the comments uh, which I received when I wrote that first TechCrunch article, which st still sticks in my mind, is that uh, it was the fact that males are underrepresented in the ranks of strippers. Why should we care? So now, why should this audience care about diversity? Why does it matter? Well, I think it matters for several reasons. It matters to me as because of fundamental fairness. If we believe that we aspire to be a meritocracy, even if we haven't achieved it yet, then you have to make sure that every step along the way is fair and you look at... Why access. does it matter? Why do we care? Why, why, why does it matter if there are fewer women in the workforce? Well, very specifically, you can look at it very selfishly, which is if the U.S. wants to maintain its current economic standard of living, it's got to figure out how to use all of the talent available to it. Absolutely. Half of the folks in this country are women. Uh, we are very soon going to be a majority minority uh, society. If we want to fill those jobs in tech, if we want to design products for the new majority, we'd better include the people who are the customers um, as designers. Mm -hmm. Adria, yeah. um, what yeah. do we do about it? I mean, are, are there constructive ways of solving this problem? Yeah, so well, to echo, echo what Frida said, there are studies that show having women right on your executive management team uh, and uh, upper management and uh, engineers actually make for a better bottom line, right? So you're going to come out with a better product. So it's not just uh, I'll be doing it. So uh, I'll share with you some of the initiatives I've seen people doing out in the field. Um, one of them is uh, the Ruby Mountain uh, Conference, Rocky Mountain Ruby Conference. Uh, last year, a lot of conferences offer scholarships. That's great, but it doesn't solve the problem that still occurs if you're a woman or a person of color. You come to a conference and you look out, or you look out there and everyone doesn't look like you. You feel alone. So they took the extra step and they said, if you get a scholarship, we'll actually pair you with an experienced Ruby developer to show you around the conference and you know, introduce you to people. And, and so basically they're saying, we will help um, introduce you to this network. And that's really the biggest thing I've seen living out here for three years. I came from Minnesota. I've been in tech for you know, 10 plus years, but that's what was different out here. Um, another program is called RailsBridge, and it was started by two women, Ruby uh, and Rails developers, because they wanted to see more diversity at conferences. The nice thing with RailsBridge is you don't have to be uh, only a woman to participate. They let guys participate. And the important thing about that is any startup you're going to work at, it's not going to be all one gender. If you're a woman, it's very unlikely. So you're going to need to work with guys. So you should be going to events that have guys. And it's not that guys don't want to help, but we have to give them opportunities for them to be allies. Yeah, Adrian, I'm going to put you on the spot here and ask you in a question we didn't uh, plan for. Have you been discriminated against? Uh, you, yeah. I mean, it, uh, how? I mean, how, and, and well, how did so, it feel? Well, I would say the, on the most basic level, it's often just um, making um, an assumption about my skill set. So, like, uh, this would happen a lot uh, a year ago, and now it's getting better. But like how I'm dressed today, often then I'll be talking with some at, talking with someone at an event or a party, right? And they'll go, "Hey, are you in marketing?" Nope. Mm -hmm. Oh, are you in product? Nope. Are you a designer? Nope. <laughs> you know. Uh, I was even at the hackathon on Saturday, and I was, you know, I was going around and talking with teams, asking what they're building, and Anna was a woman, so it's not just men who do this. She's like, do you know what Stack Overflow is? Uh. Yep, I do. So, <laughs> um, you know, so it's really about the assumptions, and that's what, you know, I'm really excited to be on this panel um, to talk about, which is cognitive bias, things that we don't even consider that is going through our mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you know, you, I read somewhere you wrote you're really angry. You call yourself the angry Hispanic, I believe, uh, in one of your blogs. I, I, I describe myself as a self-loathing Puerto Rican. Right. Uh, uh, or, or it's more yeah. accurate to say that I, I, I'm a reformed uh, self-loathing Puerto Rican because, uh, you know, from very, very young age, success was, was deeply important to me. And, and I don't know why, I don't know what, what really instilled that, but I knew that I wanted to, to be more than, than what I saw around me. 
And all the signals that I kept getting about my heritage were negative ones. You know, I, I, I heard about, you know, drug abuse, and I heard about, uh, you know, kind of squalid conditions. And, you know, by the time I got to being, you know, a teenager, I had lost kind of respect for my origins and, and, and felt very strongly that I had to just kind of, just kind of carve off a chunk of myself and pretend it didn't exist uh, in, in order to be successful and, and, and to get ahead. And in the process of that, you know, I, I, I developed uh, biases against Hispanic people. Uh, and that's me, you know, with, with, with you know, a handful of, of positive Hispanic role models in my life. You know, my mom, who's a very hardworking person. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I had my own biases. And so a, I, I think it's really essential to understand that no matter who you are, there's going to be biases. And it's okay as long as you acknowledge those biases and work very, very hard to, to understand and overcome them. And most importantly, not subject other people to the consequences of your unthinking biases. But I look at you, you're up here on, at the stage of this you know, amazing conference. How does a guy like you, who was in such, you know, such a bad situation, end up uh, being a rock star on stage like this? Well, that's the thing. I was not in a bad situation. I am extraordinarily privileged in that while my mom did not start out with a whole lot, she started out with enough initiative and drive to say, you know what, damn it, I'm going to take care of this kid. I'm going to make sure that he has a decent life. I'm going to do what I can within my limited means to take care of him. And so I had some stability in my life. I had, uh, I had access to a computer in the home by the time I was 10. And the the thing that's interesting about this trajectory is that I spent more than 10,000 hours as a kid learning about my computer and getting to know it and really being passionate about it. But I had no idea that I could take that passion and actually translate it into a career because I didn't see any people up there who looked like me. So without that, you know, it, somebody said it to me very succinctly. They said, if you, if you don't see it, you don't know that you can be it. So part of, part of my, my role now is that, you know, for younger people who are trying to get into this, I need to make absolutely clear that you can do this. And for everyone who's not like me, but who wants to help foster uh, a spirit of diversity, you have to understand that you need to elevate role models. And if you don't do that, you're not going to have young people joining the ranks of these STEM fields. It's as yeah, simple as that. Let me just a little bit more. I mean, uh, if a lot of the people in this room, and I'm saying this respectfully, received a resume from a Danilo Campos, they would assume that he probably isn't uh, you know, the same as a Stanford graduate, Stanford dropout that they can hire. How did you achieve the success? How did you become, how did you end up developing hip monk stuff? <laughs> I don't have a computer science degree. Uh, and again, I, I have no business taking a role as like a lead mobile person. But what happened, and, and my message to, to folks who want to break into this is to say, you need to create a, a body of work that speaks for itself. The reason I was able to get into Hitmonk, they never asked for my resume. They went and they looked at my apps, they saw that I could do the job, and they, they hired me on that strength. So my message to, you, to young people who want to break in is you got to work your ass off and you got to make this stuff so that you can stand on your own and say, hey, look, regardless of my credentialing, regardless of my past, I can make this. Can you make it? No. All right, so hire me. And if you're trying to hire, let's pay attention more to results and less attention to pedigrees and all of this academic crap because I have, I have spent plenty of time with people with very nice degrees who didn't know jack shit about what they were doing. So it's got to be about more than where you went to school. Frida, I tell uh, my friends that you and Mitch are two of the greatest people I know because even though you've achieved so much success, you're spending your life giving back. You've done extensive research on this topic. Tell me about the work you've done with the research shows, your studies on neuroscience, and so on. Give us a perspective here of how we can, how we can level the playing field. I think there's an incredibly unifying message that's arising today from all of the new research in neuroscience. It, it stops what I see as the very vicious, nasty, and pointless debate about some people are bigots and some people are enlightened. What it does is it says, as human beings, our brains are wired to be biased. That, that's settled. We automatically associate two things. What we associate is what some neuroscientists call the thumbprint of our culture. So now the question is, what are we going to do about it? What separates us is those who, as Adria said, decide to work on our biases, and Danilo said this also, we either look at ourselves 
and our biases, or we choose not to. It's a matter of privilege to say, I'm objective, I'm bias-free, I'm rational, Silicon Valley's a meritocracy. To say Silicon Valley's a meritocracy when you are a majority person at the top is self-fulfilling prophecy. Of course. None of us make it on our own. None of us make it without access, without opportunity, without a, people showing us the way. And to ignore that is really to ignore what privileges we actually have. So I think there's an awful lot that's coming out now that we can utilize and say, look, the study we did, it was in startups and in larger tech companies, people who share a work environment, who might spend 60, 70, 80 hours a week in the same space, have vastly different experiences of that workplace, of being included, of being excluded, and those diverge by race and by gender. And so lots of people say, oh, no, 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 if we had a diversity strategy, that would be unfair advantage. My point is, the situation right now is one of profound unfair advantage. Yes. And unless we take steps to mitigate it, we don't have a meritocracy, we don't have a level playing yes. field. Adrian, you want to add something? <clears throat> yeah, to, to add on to what Frida said, it, with an example, um, so I volunteer and help out with uh, a program called Girl Develop It. So they teach classes uh, in the evenings or over the weekend. HTML, CSS, JavaScript, iOS, and uh, classes always sell out. You know, they're affordable, uh, 10 to $100, but they have scholarships. Uh, so I was helping to TA, and this is a great thing for developers to do, men and women, volunteer, TA, help out, um, a couple weekends ago. And um, I thought there were just one or two women, but there were actually six women from non-engineering roles who had come from Google to take this weekend class. And they asked me to take a photo of them. You know, and I asked them why they were here, and they, they wanted to be better at their jobs. Plus, they wanted to see if maybe JavaScript was something that they wanted to pursue uh, further into their role. So really, this comes down to opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we have about five minutes left. Um, even though I'm very critical about Silicon Valley, I'm also critical about US competitiveness. I still believe Silicon Valley is the greatest place on this earth to build a technology company. It is the most open, inclusive community in the world. And it, you know, the fact that I can be so critical and yet be so respected is, is amazing. Nowhere else could I have gotten away with it. In other countries, they would have kicked me out of there and I, you know, I, would, I, mean, I wouldn't have survived two days. But here, I'm, I'm, I'm welcomed. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm accepted readily. So are all of you. Okay. Now, another thing is that I've, I said I've been uh, negative about Silicon Valley and women for the last three years. I tell you, I've seen a dramatic shift happening in this ecosystem. I've seen women now mentoring each other, helping each other. Uh, the Women 2.0 event that uh, I watched coming out of nowhere, a thousand women basically now helping, mentoring. Amazing advances. The fact that we can have these discussions here on stage is an amazing advance. Three years ago, it would be inconceivable to have a panel like this at an event like this. So I want you to conclude with your perspectives on Silicon Valley. And you know, where, where do you think, what, what do you think lies ahead and, and why are you optimistic? You know, everything, everything good that has come to my career, uh, so much of that has been fueled by what is possible here uniquely. And that isn't an abstract thing, that's, that's not a geographic thing, that's a people thing. So we've got some of the best and brightest and most decent people on the entire earth all around us right here. And I am heartened by the fact that, you know, in speaking about this, people have reached out to me, they've been eager to, to, to pat me on the back and to reassure me that, that you know, things will get better. And they, they've, they've wanted to, to talk to me about how, how together we can, we can make a better place. So, so the eagerness and the energy to improve, I think, is absolutely here. And, and it, it, it just, it makes my heart swell to know that we have the best that we could ask for to make this uh, a better place, and, and everyone's eager. Adrian? So I, I share those opinions about uh, the Valley as well. If you think about it, this is the place to come and take chances. This is the place to come and make mistakes. Uh, and with that being said, not just with technology, but how you think about things, right? Uh, there are so many people here who are help, 
helpful and uh, very outgoing, and they're willing to um, reconsider how they've been doing things, because that's, that's the nature of technology. It's the nature of efficiency. Uh, and uh, I, can, I can tell you, if you're watching this and you've thought about coming to the Bay, you should come. You know, we're here um, for people to support you, and it's been really awesome. I'm really glad that I, I made the choice to come out here. Frida? Well, I concur, and I think everybody ought to jump in. But I think also, being well-meaning isn't enough. Saying I'm a good person, I'm a smart person, doesn't substitute for doing your homework, for rolling up your sleeves, finding out about what other people's experiences and, and barriers are. So Women 2.0 got mentioned. We, we did 10 scholarships for women, women of color to attend Women 2.0 recently. And uh, the head, one of the founders of Women 2.0 contacted me and said, I'm getting a lot of pushback can you help me answer the question when people say, having scholarships for women of color is discriminatory? And I said, are you effing kidding me? <laughs> it's a conference for women where you have to get in, if you've got, only if you've got a woman on, on your founding team, you have one or more women. That's not discriminatory, but you want, but you think making sure that women of color are well represented at that event is discriminatory? Really? So I think we want an environment where we can challenge each other, where we can say, wait a second, I assume your heart's in the right place, but you just stuck your foot in your mouth, speaking of other body parts, and let's talk about why what you said or did is exclusionary. Then we've got everybody at the table. Then we've given people permission to say, this is my experience, and it's as important as other people's experience. I want to thank you, all of you, for uh, doing this. I want to thank Jason for having us here. Jason? Thanks. Oh, hey. Yeah, a big round of applause. I think it's a very important discussion. So um, we, uh, we take it very seriously. Um, uh, as the token white male left in Silicon Valley as a founder, <laughs> I know it's like all Indian and Asian guys now. And, I'm one of the few old white guys, but um, we, we really take it seriously here, and we actually have an email, diversity at launch.co, because the, actually the biggest challenge for us has been with judges. We actually had a really great success this year at um, getting a lot of women to the event and, and different races and having just a wonderful you know, um, representation here and balance um, by seeking out organizations. But we, where we still have a problem is judges. Because to be a judge, you have to have, you know, I don't know, 10 or 20 years of going through this and success. And it seems like the number of women in technology with that profile is very low, and they get invited to every single event. And so I'm like, please, Marissa, come to the event. Please, please. I'm busy. I have this going on. She couldn't make it this year. She'll probably come next year. Um, how, do, how, do you, how, do you, how should I think about that as being somebody who wants to do the right thing? I feel like we've done the right thing in terms of giving scholarships and having diversity in the audience. I feel like having the panel is really a great thing to address it head on. But how should I do better with the judging? Should I lower the standard for judges? Or, you know, <laughs> or just have diversity? Frida, I, mean, I don't mean to throw like a bomb at the end of the panel, but I do, because this is a debate that different genders and different races in our own company are having. Jason, you're getting our panel wound up. I know they're hot buttons. You just, you just hit that hot button. What, what should we do? I'm sorry, come on, everyone. No, this is, and this is a, this is a debate internally yeah. amongst my whole team. Well, so first of all, I find the, the expression lowering standards or we're only looking for qualified candidates, I find those to be offensive. Well-meaning, but offensive. Because as you've heard from this panel, I think what counts a lot is the distance traveled not just getting to the finish line. Because we continue to reward people who start on third base and swing the bat and think they hit a home run. And that's as far as I can go with sports analogy. <laughs> um, but I think, so I say to you, why do you need 20 years experience? Whatever well, you were doing 20 years ago is irrelevant to tech today. Why don't you get a team together? Why don't you get some, take a, a cue from Adria's example of, of um, Rails Bridge or it, buddy up with people. Yeah. Do, a, do an old judge, somebody who's my age with a, you know, Yeah, I guess mentee. the answer, yeah, and so the answer to that, we've had that exact conversation is, 
the people who are coming up to demo their companies frequently come to me and say, why is that person a judge? Because I have more experience than them, or they're not qualified to judge me because they're not as successful as I am. Like, having Chamath as a judge, it's like, wow, look at the track record. Like, you can't deny it, right? Marissa, you can't deny the track record. And just the startups themselves have come to me and said, I, I want to be judged by somebody who's got three, four, five times the amount of success I have. Isn't, isn't the proof in the pudding, though? If the questions are the good questions, why does it really matter how many years stacked up to let those questions get answered? Yeah. Find people who can ask tough questions, find people who can ask good, insightful questions, and, and let that be the bar for you. And one of the things I'll say is, <clears throat> I see this happen with geeks of both genders and all races, is often the really good people, the really experienced people, they just want to keep working behind their computer. They don't want to come out to these events, really, because they see it as a detraction away from meeting their next sprint deadline, right? Um, I'm, I'm even dealing with that within SendGrid, where I'm like, hey, it'd be great to have you uh, go and speak about Chef. No, no, I don't want to do that, because I'd rather... Yeah. So, so I'd ask I... the question, what is success? So maybe if you change your criteria, maybe you can't hire an engineering manager who has not successfully recruited um, and promoted a diverse group of engineers. What if that was a requirement? Who would you be looking at as sort of qualified or the best? Yeah. What if you can't be a judge unless you've been successful at building a really inclusive corporate culture? Mm -hmm. So it's really what we value. It's yeah. what we decide counts. And then we somehow come up with all these subjective criteria and we assign points to them and we add them up and we said, gosh, aren't we objective? No, you're not. So let's, let's start from a new clean sheet of paper about what matters. I think um, that's profoundly said and wise and it's got me thinking like maybe we just have to change why we're selecting each of the judges. You know, clearly people want judges who have big bank roles to invest in them, but there could be other reasons and you've got me thinking and for that I'm very thankful. Um, this has been a great panel and I hope we can really be a positive force at the launch festival again. We're here to support entrepreneurship and inspire it. And this was a very inspiring panel, so I'd like to just thank Vivek and the whole crew for one more time. This is great. Did everybody get to say where, that, what they're hopeful about? Did everybody answer your final question, or did? Yeah. Everybody I answered your final question about? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. I think so. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Okay, so uh, let's uh, get our next. Uh,